The Iowa International Center Dialogue Series is a monthly educational program available at no cost to the public, thanks to the generous support of DuPont Pioneer and supporting sponsors. Dialogue events and videos offer a unique opportunity for our community to engage in and learn from important cultural conversations with international experts, and to draw on and highlight the extensive knowledge these individuals bring to our schools, workplaces, and community. For more information about the Dialogue Series and the Iowa International Center, please visit www.iowainternationalcenter.org. Um, yeah, my name is, is Derek Wilson. As you'll see from the, um, the, the title, I'm from the University of Nantes in France. So I, I perhaps should explain how I, how I came to get there. Basically in the 19... I am Scottish. I was born in Scotland um, and I, I grew up and studied in Scotland. In the 1980s, I, I was a student uh, at the time of Margaret Thatcher's uh, changes in Britain in the 1980s. And in the 1990s, I practiced as a solicitor a kind of attorney in Scotland, principally Edinburgh, uh, during the 1990s. When I was living in Edinburgh, uh, this foreign student came over from France to finish her studies, and um, uh, I, I, I'm not going to ask you about what happened when you were over in Edinburgh, but what she, she, she actually met a man, and that was me. And basically, we got married in the, within a few years. Um, we, we, we remained in Edinburgh. We had our first daughter in Edinburgh. But in 2000, uh, October 2000, we moved to France. I've been teaching law students in France since 2001, initially in the private sector, but I've now qualified and joined the public sector. And um, uh, that's basically how uh, I came to be working um, at the University of Nantes. How do I know the people from Drake? Well, you know, the University of Nantes is the partner university for the Drake Law School. And uh, there are professors and students who come every uh, summer, every May and June, to the law school uh, in Nantes, and I've been working as part of that program since 2003. So that's who I am, uh, uh, and that's how I ended up uh, coming here. The, 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 re the reason, basically, I'm principally here is, of course, the referendum um, th th that happened uh, in Scotland. Um, and I'm assuming that you know what happened last month. Uh, most of you, if, if you're not too sure, there was a referendum on the 18th of September. The question, should Scotland be an independent country? The answer, yes or no. Um, who got to decide? The people living in Scotland. So I don't live in Scotland, so I, I didn't have a vote. I'm sure, or I hope you know where Scotland is, but just in case anyone's a little bit embarrassed, it's the northerly part of the piece of ground called Great Britain. which along with Northern Ireland, uh, England and Wales, uh, gives us the United Kingdom. Um, and why is Scotland easily identifiable is maybe a question that is worth mentioning. It was once an independent kingdom before it joined the kingdoms of England uh, and the Princedom of Wales and the Kingdom of Ireland to become the United Kingdom. I'm assuming you know most of that. I hope. So, uh, in this vote that happened uh, in September, the protagonists for the Yes campaign, there is a separatist party called the Scottish Nationalist Party. Its leader is the First Minister, uh, Alex Salmond. Um, the, the party are known as the SNP, the Nationalists. They want secession. And the deputy leader is called Nicola Sturgeon. Very fishy names. I don't know if you've noticed. Salmond and Sturgeon. Um, easy to remember, I think, and uh, maybe not. So, um, the protagonists uh, for the No campaign, uh, the leader of the No campaign was a Scottish um, member of parliament called Alastair Darling. He was our Minister of Finance, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, during the financial crisis. And um, they thought it better to have a Scottish person fighting the No campaign and not the Prime Minister, David Cameron, that you see there in the middle, and his assistant, uh, the, the, the new Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne. So th these were the people who were trying to tell us what to think.
The result, you may already know that too, that it was quite um, popular in the news. No 2 million, yes 1.6 million. 55, 45 if you want to put it in round figures. The amazing thing was the turnout, 84.59%. We say 85%. I know we're exaggerating a little bit, but it's just a little bit. And the, there were some, unre uh, some rejected ballots. And the feedback is that it was the, the people under the age of 55 who mainly voted yes. So people over 55 mainly voted no. The fallout. Um, the day after the, um, uh, the no vote, Alex Salmond resigned as First Minister and it now looks like his deputy will become uh, the new leader of the SNP. Um, and there, there was also a bit of trouble in Glasgow's George Square, which usually in, in daytime looks like the picture on the left, but on, on the evening of the vote there was a lot of tired people. I think they've been up all night waiting for the result and some of them might have had a drink. I don't want to make any kind of insinuations, but they all got a bit tired and all got a bit aggressive. Um, so what comes next? What is to come next? Well, um, apparently there's this vow. This vow has been made and apparently there will be more powers for Scotland's Parliament. Um, Salmond, who had resigned, suggested that the no voters were tricked into voting no because plans were already afoot to dilute what was promised in the vow. Now this vow was made two days before the election. Okay. Uh, and just to make things a little bit worrying, David Cameron did suggest that this vow was somehow tied into answering another problem, a problem of representation in London. And it's called the West Lothian Question. And it's this problem that Scottish um, members of Parliament vote in London, Westminster, over matters which, in Scotland, are reserved to the Scottish Parliament. So um, this is the West Lothian question. There's a question of fairness about that. And he's asked William Hague um, to, to deal with the question. To make matters a bit more difficult for the British Prime Minister, um, one of the other people who signed the, 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 the vow, the chap in the middle, Ed Miliband, uh, he insisted that this was never discussed before they signed the vow. And Alistair Darling also said that this vow, the promise that was made in this national newspaper two days before the election, the commitments in the vow must be honoured. So Haig has said that this question of Scottish representation will be an issue in the 2015 election. So if any of you are, are big fans of electoral law, you can follow that story. So let's see. I suppose, how did the, all of this happen is perhaps maybe one question we should address. Um, and really it all came from the 2011 Scottish Parliament elections. Um, in the last two weeks before the election, the Nationalists, the SNP, were behind in the polls. They weren't even first. But not only did they overtake the Labour Party, who had been first, but they managed to secure uh, a majority of members of the Scottish Parliament when you added all of the other parties together. So this was under an electoral system which was specially designed to ensure that no party would have a majority, that this would never happen. It's called the don't system, the don't system of proportional representation. It's spelled D apostrophe H O N D T, but you pronounce it don't. And I make a joke with my students that you don't get a majority with don't, but, but they did. So, um, maybe this can help you to understand why the vow was made and why people were nervous about September's votes. Uh, it did look like the Scottish voters were changing their mind in the last two weeks again. Was it an accidental referendum uh, is another in interesting question. Um, in the 2010 UK elections, David Cameron succeeded Gordon Brown and came to Edinburgh with his new respect agenda. And in 2011, as I've said, the SNP secured this majority uh, in the parliament with less than 50% of the vote. But the question is, was this a vote for independence? 
they were voting for the separatist party, but were they voting for independence? Um, the reason I asked the question is because um, they were polling at the time, and the polling said 30% wanted independence, but 46% voted for the separatists. So it looks more like it was a rejection of the other parties. Anyway, how did the Prime Minister, how did the British Prime Minister David Cameron react to a separatist party taking control of one part of the United Kingdom? Did he grab the bull by the horns and initiate a UK-wide debate about the future of the state now that one of its nations had voted for a party seeking to dismantle it? Did he do that? Or did he look at the opinion polls saying that no one wanted independence because part of the SNP vote was a rejection of Labour based on public opinion polls? And in so doing, and in so doing, and in doing nothing, <laughs> did he let the separatists set the pace? Um, within a year, uh, within a year and a half, um, the Edinburgh Agreement was signed. There was a ceremonial signing uh, in Princess Street uh, with, with a view of the castle uh, behind um, of a, a document called the Edinburgh Agreement. Um, and this was about self-determination for Scotland, but with Westminster's permission. So Scotland could have a, a, a referendum, but with permission from London. Um, the, the, the terms of the agreement are there. It should have a legal base, be legislated for by the Scottish Parliament, be conducted so as to command the confidence of parliaments, governments and people, and deliver a fair test and a decisive expression of the views of people in Scotland. And a result that everyone would, would respect. And when we see the result, 55-45, they, they manage that, I think. The interesting thing was votes for 16 and 17 year olds. And what's interesting about that is um, this was simply an idea put forward by the Scottish nationalists. I think it was a way of them testing their powers. Uh, they just said votes for 16 and 17 year olds. And the question then is who wants to be the politician who would say why not? <laughs> because these 16, 17 year olds would obviously eventually cease to be 16 and 17 and like all of us become a bit older and might remember who rejected them. So the vote was extended to, to, to children aged 16 and 17. resume of what Scotland is. I think it's, all, it's worth reminding anyone that Scotland is a Roman creation. Um, the Romans, when they uh, came to the United Kingdom, they only managed to uh, get so far up the country. Scotland was given the name Alba, which translates as white. And it's because it's the white, the white area where all the snow is. And if you think of the Romans, if you think of Italy, I think they just got only so far north in Britain and said, we're not going any further, let's build a wall. So they built a wall, Hadrian's Wall, which is quite close to the current border between Scotland and England. They did build another wall further up, but it wasn't as permanent. And this was a thing that acted to divide the Celtic tribes. Um, there's another element in what it means to be Scottish, and it, it's quite simply this, not being English. Um, there was also a, a migration of Germanic tribes, as, as the map shows, from um, uh, Northern Europe. And this created, th this Anglo-Saxon invasion meant that there were, uh, there was a different race uh, occupying the southeast of the country. Um, moving forward in the history, if some of you have seen the film Braveheart, uh, unlike the Welsh, who were subjugated by the English, um, Wallace managed to resist the English uh, and Edward I. And by 1314, uh, quite an important year, because 1314, if you can do your mathematics, is 700 years ago. So it was quite, this is maybe why the Nationalists wanted the referendum this year. But it was in 1314 that at Bannockburn, Robert Bruce was able to send proud Edward 
and his army homeward to think again. Now, I've put these, no these words in, in quote marks because I'm quoting the song that we Scots sing uh, whenever we are about to lose a match of soccer or whenever we get a medal um, at some kind of sporting event that allows Scotland to participate. We sing a song about a, a victory we won 700 years ago. Um, this was followed by the declaration of our broth. Uh, constitutional lawyers uh, uh, would, would more pr probably say that you guys invented constitutions, but you, there are some people who say that our declaration of our broth is the first time the people said uh, what, we, what we should have, uh, that the people should decide these things. But we'll leave it there, we'll leave it there. Um, um, and then in 1328, the English recognised Scotland, the Scotland recognised England, and, and the, we have two separate countries. So the question is, how did the, the Kingdom of Scotland come to join the Kingdom of England? Well, it's all about the, the monarchy. Uh, in 1603, the death of uh, Queen Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen, after whom Virginia was named, uh, leaving no children means that someone has got to inherit the crown. It's James VI. Who is James VI? He's James VI of Scotland. So the King of Scotland inherits England. This is a lottery win uh, in, in terms of monarchy. Uh, uh, successions. Uh, Scotland being a small, poor country, England being a, a big, rich one. He tried in 1607 to get the countries united, but the English Parliament rejected this. And throughout the, the rest of the 17th century, there, there was um, some upheaval, civil war. Um, but it, was, it, it still took us to the beginning of the 18th century before we united with the English. It was 1707. The first part of the question is a, a thing called the Darien Scheme. Now, you may have heard that the English were quite good at colonizing. I don't know if you've, if anyone's met, you've heard that at all about the English, they had colonies. Um, we tried it, but we weren't very good at it. That was our colony. It was quite cleverly placed. When you look at the, 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 the Central America, this little spot for a colony is quite clever, quite strategic. But unfortunately, it was a financial disaster. And it meant that the Scottish people, the Scottish um, elites were bankrupted. So in 1707, when they did sign, they did receive money from the English. The English bought their Darien scheme investments at cost price instead of the real value, which was zero. So this was summed up by the Scottish poet Robert Burns with the song, uh, such a parcel of rogues in a nation. Bought and sold for English gold, such a parcel of rogues in a nation. So the deal, um, it, was a, it was a treaty. So what was the deal? Scotland was to preserve its church, its education, and its legal system. So when I said I was a Scottish lawyer in the 1990s, I practiced law in Scotland. I cannot and I could not practice law in the rest of the United Kingdom, okay? So um, how would you... Um, um, characterize the, the agreement. Was it a marriage, like a husband and wife, where two people come together who, and they can perhaps at some other time separate or divorce? Or was it an indivisible cocktail? And what I've put up there for you is the Scottish cocktail, Whiskey Mac. where you mix the Scottish uh, whisky uh, with the English uh, ginger wine. And it's a nice warming cocktail for winter evenings. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you, you drink, um, but, uh, but that does actually characterize the union between Scotland and England. Scotland was abolished, England was abolished. When you mix these two drinks together, you've got a new drink and you cannot separate them because the two old parliaments, in theory, don't exist anymore. So, that's us got the United Kingdom. Why leave? After uh, 1707, there were some early teething problems. Maybe some of you know the story of the Jacobite Risings. You've maybe heard of Bonnie Prince Charlie, uh, the young pretender. He lost this dreadful battle at Culloden in 1746 and had to disguise himself as a woman to escape. And if any of you drink or have heard of the, the, the drink Drambuie, this was allegedly the recipe left behind by Bonnie Prince Charlie. So um, th th 
there were initial teething problems in the 18th century. However, very quickly after the, the Highland, um, the, 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 the Jacobite rising was put down, everything changed and there was this new uh, banal union where the Highland regiments, who used to be so dangerous, ended up fighting for the British Empire. And the, uh, the Scottish uh, people enjoyed a new economic prosperity as they became fully engaged in this union. So we have to really come forward to the 20th century before we see Scottish nationalism taking off. The SNP was formed in 1934 from the formation of uh, a fusion of two other groups, the merger of two other groups, and they were really seen as a fringe group. Well-meaning, nice, but a little bit crazy. And although they got a member of parliament in 1945, that, these were special conditions. We just had a war. It was in 1967 there was the shock result when a member of parliament was elected in Hamilton, and things really took off when they discovered oil in the North Sea off the north of Scotland. Um, the, the SNP suddenly became an electoral force, and they held a and they they started a campaign in which they put forward this idea that it's Scotland's oil. And in 1974, they held um, the balance of power uh, in the Labour government. Um, as a result of the, the, the prominence of the SNP in the 1970s, uh, there was a first referendum. And this is where the Scottish National Party recently were saying that you cannot trust London, you cannot trust Westminster. In 1979, there was a, a referendum for giving more power to Scotland, Scotland having a little parliament with some power. It's called devolution. And um, because of a late amendment in the referendum, saying that everybody had, that 40% of the people had to vote yes, a thing you would never really get in any election, um, uh, you, it, you can, well, I suppose you can guess what happened. Scotland did vote yes, but they didn't vote yes with sufficient uh, enthusiasm. So 32.9% uh, voted yes, 30% voted no, they didn't reach the 40%. To keep things fair, they had a referendum for the Welsh, and the Welsh uh, completely rejected the idea of uh, devolution at that time. What came next are the Thatcher years, um, 1979 to 1997. Uh, the Scottish experience was you could vote for anybody, but you always got Margaret Thatcher, and then her successor, John Major. And of course, Margaret Thatcher was not the, the most um, conciliatory of, of politicians. Um, divisive, I've put, divisive, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, one of the things that was really controversial was that she introduced what was called the poll tax. The real title is the Abolition of Rates Act 1987. And this was introduced a year later in England, and it caused uh, riots in England. The dissatisfaction, this idea of a, a democratic deficit caused people in Scotland and civic society to come together. And in 1988, there was a claim uh, of right for Scotland, uh, echoing the claim of right from the 17th century. And uh, in 1989, a, Scot a Scottish Constitutional Convention came together to try to draw up plans so that by 1995, they published a document called Scotland's Parliament, Scotland's Right. So they basically prepared what I, I like to compare to one of these microwave meals that you can buy in the supermarket. You take it out, out of the packet, put it in the microwave, press the button, you've got a parliament. Okay, it was a ready, ready, to, ready to install parliament. One thing that's worth also mentioning was that um, the, the, the Thatcher miracle uh, was funded by oil which came from off the north coast of Scotland. Uh, you might, it's impossible to read the, the figures there, but uh, if you just look on the left-hand side, when you see most oil coming, uh, most oil revenue coming into the British economy, these were the years when Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister. So a, ca a campaign poster from the Scottish National Party comparing her to Dracula, saying no wonder she's laughing, she's got Scotland's oil. Um, it turns out it was true, although we didn't have that information at the time. No, that was a, a study that could only be made uh, in recent years. So there were, uh, Margaret Thatcher was getting a lot of money from, from the oil north of Scotland. 
What happened in 1997 then, when finally Margaret Thatcher and then John Major had, were voted out of power? The UK brought in Tony Blair, there he is, waving, uh, 10 Downing Street. The election of Tony Blair with this election promise to implement the plan for devolution that had already been drawn up by the Scottish Constitutional Con Convention meant that by September there was a referendum. And in that referendum, Scotland voted yes and yes for what we call devolution. That's handing over power, not independence, just handing over power to this Scottish, to a new Scottish Parliament. Now, I've said that when we voted, I've written there, we voted more with the previous 18 years in mind than with what this would lead to. So I've, I've put up some really ridiculous uh, pictures of exercising or g getting rid of uh, Dracula and so on. We were thinking of not having what we just had again. We weren't really thinking about s stopping uh, or breaking up the United Kingdom when we all voted yes in 1997. So, we said yes to devolution, and so did Wales, but only just. This meant there was the enactment of the Scotland Act, and in 1998, Northern Ireland got themselves a power-sharing assembly, and in May 1999, Scotland had a parliament, and Wales, down in Cardiff, they had an assembly. You've got pictures of the Scottish Parliament in Edinburgh, the Welsh Assembly in Cardiff, and Stormont Castle in Northern Ireland. So, devolution. The little nations of the United Kingdom now had their own parliament. Of course, the problem with creating a new parliament is, of course, I legislate, therefore I am. That's what parliaments do. They legislate. And so, why create a new parliament if it's only going to mirror what is happening in the rest of the UK? If Scotland's Parliament did exactly the same as the British Parliament was doing for England, then people would be saying, why do you exist? So this meant that the Scottish Parliament could therefore create a distinctly Scottish policies on things like elderly health care, I've spelt that wrongly, free student tuition fees, a smoking ban and so on. So they could make life in Scotland different. But there's a second part of this. Uh, the Scottish Parliament also did not need to follow any changes that were occurring anywhere else in the United Kingdom. So in England, they've got new approaches to hospitals, new approaches to education, and Scotland has quite simply not followed that. Still feeling uh, British, are we? Maybe not. So, what would the UK have lost if Scotland had voted for independence, is the next question. Defence was the first one. Scotland, the Scottish Nationalists were, were seeking 10% of the, um, the military capacity that the UK government have got. And this would have put Brit England, the rest of the UK, under some pressure with maintaining their commitments to NATO. Um, this would have effectively have been a further 10% cut in capacity. The nuclear deterrent was also something that was a big, a big question, a big card in the, in the negotiations. Um, the United Kingdom's nuclear submarines are very safely stored uh, in, in Scotland. And some people voted, or some people wanted Scotland to vote yes because they saw this as a way that uh, the United Kingdom would be forced to disarm uh, uh, unilaterally. Because there was nowhere else they could put their nuclear submarines safely. Um, talk of a permanent seat on the Security Council. Um, they were very anxiously looking at the example of when the USSR broke up uh, and Russia got the seat of the former Soviet Union. Um, but why should a small country like the United Kingdom have a permanent seat uh, if it doesn't have nuclear power and if it's smaller now? So there was a bit of a worry there over that. They would have fewer voting rights in Europe. 
um, a lower ranking in the G7 or G8, uh, G20, uh, with a lower um, GDP, and they had, would have less weight in other global institutions, such as the IMF and the World Bank. You shouldn't forget it's also quite complicated unraveling a country. And the example that I've given there is the Czech Republic and Slovakia. They are arguing still today about small things that, that that's ours, that sh you, know, you should take that, we should get this. Um, when you've got an integrated economy, an integrated company, country, it's quite a lot of work tearing it all apart. Of course, there was no guarantee that these negotiations would be um, uh, friendly, which might lead to problems in the future. And there was also the question of Wales and Northern Ireland. I've put up the picture of the Spice Girls, uh, because when Jerry, the one that's wearing the British flag, when she left the Spice Girls, it was never the same. I don't know how it was for you. but. Um, <laughs> She wasn't the most talented member, arguably, but when, she, when, the, when, when the group splits up, it just changes the, the chemistry, it changes the balance. And so if Scotland had left the United Kingdom, uh, what would have happened to Northern Ireland and Wales? They'd be small nations attached to England. It, some were saying it would reopen the debate for a united Ireland. And the Welsh were saying we should have a constitutional convention and discuss the, the new constitutional arrangements. other symbolic things was the flag. Um, the blue bit in the flag is Scotland. So without the, Scot the, 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 one, the, the, the flag you see in the centre there is the British Union Jack without Scotland. And that just doesn't look as good, does it? It doesn't work. But could you imagine um, something happening to the American flag so that you had to change that iconic symbol that everyone recognizes as your nation. It's, it's a stupid thing. It's a small thing. It's just a flag. But it's still Scotland leaving the United Kingdom would have meant that the, the colors of the flag would come into question in a way that was never a question when, when you guys decided you didn't want to be with us anymore. And of course, maybe a new name for the country. Politics would also have got complicated. Would David Cameron still be the Prime Minister if he was in the chair when Scotland left? The opposition leader, Ed Miliband, uh, would he still be in, in his position? The coalition agreement has fixed an election for 2015 uh, in May. Would that still take place? Um, Scotland votes for the left-leaning members of uh, the British Parliament, so it might have forced the rest of the UK's parties of the left to merge or die, because it, it certainly gave an advantage to the, uh, the Conservatives, to the right wing. And of course, there would then be a UK election in 2015 in the, in the middle of these um, negotiations with Scotland. And Scottish members of parliament would have been elected in May 2015, but as soon as Scotland had become independent, they would have left, which would have caused all kinds of chaos uh, politically. So, um, what were the decisive factors in this uh, decision? David Cameron made an emotional appeal. Did that work? Maybe ex-Prime Minister Gordon Brown, he's Scottish. Maybe his intervention worked. Um, there was news at the end of the campaign of some of Scotland's financial institutions switching their headquarters outside Scotland if there was a yes vote. And of course, there was um, long-mooted uh, fears that put forward about the pension. What pension would you get? Or was it the vow that we've already mentioned? There certainly was continuing uncertainty when the people came to vote. Um, and if they had voted no, they were told they would get more devolution in some form or another. But with the Conservatives, the Labour and the Liberal Democrats, or Lib Dems, being three different parties, they all had a different idea as to what that would be. And so they couldn't really give any detail. So this was not certain. If Scotland had voted yes, uh, even then the position was uncertain because they were only voting to allow somebody to negotiate with somebody else. So it would be between the UK government that was going to change in, in May 2015 
and, and probably the Scottish National Party and some other people. And they would negotiate something. But when, when the Scottish people voted, they didn't know what the result of these negotiations would be. So th this uncertainty remained. Now, I've mentioned the vow at the beginning. This is very important. Um, the, the one question referendum forced the SNP to adopt a strategy projecting a vision of what independence could be like, this vision of what it could be like. And because there was only one question, it forced the no campaign to highlight that nothing was certain and that everything was negotiable. if Scotland voted yes. So you can see what a, 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 what a pretty almost boring argument this is. One side is you know, building castles in the air, the other side is pss, bursting them. Um, to be fair to the No campaign, it comprised three competing UK parties, meaning there were divergences in their visions of future constitutional change. And this was illustrated by this last minute rush. Um, after the yes vote was put at 51% to guarantee that Scotland would have more powers if it voted no. But none of the parties were capable of saying what this meant in detail. And of course, not being able to say what this means in detail is exactly the criticism they'd given for the last year and a half of the yes campaign. So, um, hmm. Right. So there were other uncertainties, international issues. It was put forward that who, Scotland would not be the, the, the successor state. Scotland would be a new state, would have to rejoin these international organisations. And while, of course, as a member of the UK, Scotland presently uh, conforms to all of the criteria for membership, they would still have to apply to rejoin various um, uh, organisations. Continuing membership of the European Union was the most complicated one because a new state must apply to join while a successor state doesn't have to apply. And of course, all new member states must join this currency. I don't know if you've heard of the euro. You must get, you know, it's a very stable currency. Um, it is now, it's better now. Um, there's also other complications with the free movement Schengen Agreement, which Britain is, is not a member to. And Margaret Thatcher, or Maggie as we call her, she obtained an, a, a rebate from the European Union in the 1980s. And any British Prime Minister who loses Mag Margaret Thatcher's rebate is automatically a loser. Okay, you cannot lose the rebate. So there's all kinds of stress about which we shouldn't have a rebate um, anymore. Maybe in the, in the 1980s it was fair, but we shouldn't have one now. Uh, it was argued that Scotland would get more funding from the, the common agricultural policy, so losing the rebate wouldn't be necessarily a big problem. But on a positive side, Scotland would get a commissioner in the European Union and maybe more members of the European Parliament, maybe 12 instead of 6. Relations with the rest of the UK, border controls was one of the f f scare stories that were put up. Scotland needs immigrants, England doesn't. And uh, that was one of the, f the, the, the scare stories that if Scotland encouraged immigration, there, we might see borders, uh, uh, border controls. It could also affect ongoing trade and business. The biggest uncertainty, uh, and for me, one of the, the, personally the biggest worry was the, was the money, the currency. It's our pound too, was what the, the SNP were saying. And while some idea of um, setting up a shadow currency uh, was possible, um, or just using uh, the pound, the first the sterilization is we just use the pound, or the shadow currency, this peg currency linked to the pound, uh, and following it. While that was possible, the plan that was being put forward by the SNP was that there should be a full monetary union with the Bank of England in London acting as the central bank. However, th there's a little problem with what that plan entailed. Simply, the United Kingdom would have to agree to this and they said that they wouldn't.
there's also the story of the euro in the face of speculative attacks and, and bailouts. Why should the English uh, guarantee, uh, take the risk of going into a monetary union with, with a, an independent Scotland? Of course, the solution to the euro problem was ever closer union um, and not independence. So that's what they're saying should happen in Europe. We should all get closer together. And the nationalists are going in the other way. So th their idea of having a fiscal pact uh, raises all kinds of questions. Who would decide its terms? And because it would basically be a, a pact dictated by the English, is that independence? Of course, there were other options. A new currency, the pound Scots, but nobody mentioned this. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't have used monopoly money, uh, but um, it, it was a possibility. But it, would, it could be issued by Scottish banks with conversion of existing Scottish-based assets and debts, and this conversion rate, depending on the markets, it would be volatile due to oil. It was possible. It just wasn't put on the table. It wasn't debated. It wasn't discussed. The downside, of course, would be trading with the rest of the United Kingdom, because the good thing about someone who, who's in Alaska who wants to buy something from someone in Boston is that the same dollar works. And there's a bigger distance between Alaska and Boston than between Scotland and England. So that was one option. The other option, of course, was the euro. And as I mentioned earlier, we've had our problems with the euro in the past. There is this requirement for new states to commit to joining the euro. But there was a bit of a problem um, when Britain was a member of the exchange rate mechanism uh, in 1992 that they called Black um, Wednesday. Scotland's problem was that they'd have to have their own currency to join the exchange rate mechanism. And none of this was on the table. None of it had, was really clear. So this was very, very uncertain. Scotland's got a financial system. Uh, outside London, Scottish financial services, uh, Edinburgh is, is, is the, the, the top town, the top city outside London. And all of our insurance companies and other financial uh, bodies that are based in Scotland would, 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 would require, would be put under quite a lot of strain. And really, would it work a central bank, lender of last resort for two countries? There would need to be um, very similar, almost identical financial regulations. And of course, how practical would that be? Of course, it's also incompatible with European law to have two central uh, one central bank for two countries. And um, the market perceptions about the stability of the monetary union might lead to speculation uh, if the terms were not very uh, rigorous. And again, we get back to the question, how independent does that make us then? If, we, if we've got to just have things exactly the same as the English. What could Scotland have gained? Well, they could have chosen their own government. They'd have a Scottish constitution. They'd, uh, win, they, were, they would say in their campaign that Westminster has not addressed and had no plans to address the huge disparity in wealth between London and the southeast of England and the rest of the UK. And they said they could address that. Scotland could have an economic and welfare regime that was tailored to the specific features of the Scottish economy. And Scotland is a little bit more left-wing, so it could ha have a country with a more left-wing, anti-privatisation, free healthcare, minimum wage philosophy. And of course, it could be non-nuclear, and a small country less inclined to be dragged into wars. And of course, the Scottish oil fund was something that was also mentioned, just like Norway has got. So there were things to gain. Um, could the, the Scottish um, uh, economy afford it? Um, well, it all depended on whether the taxes could pay for public services. And at present, there's more spending in Scotland per person than elsewhere in the UK. And the money from that seems to come from the oil. So there's a, an intake of tax that Scotland's got with and without oil um, that basically justifies Scotland getting more money at the moment. But if Scotland were to be independent, um, it's not clear whether they could have had a, an oil fund. Um, and, um, you know, this might have, and, and maintain their current expenditure plans. So, 
Other things that they had to avoid that might have been a problem, the Queen. Of course, we love the Queen. I don't know if you love the Queen, but we're British and she's like some kind of relative that, she, she's not, uh, she's like a relative that you know is never going to speak to you and would be embarrassed if she met you, uh, that, to say that we're related. But we all know the Queen and there is an attachment to the Queen that was seen with her, her Diamond uh, Jubilee uh, celebrations a couple of years ago. Um, but the way that the nationalists had dealt with that was to say that she would be the head of state, just like she's the queen of uh, other Commonwealth countries. So even things like the, the, the announced pregnancy of a, of a second child for, for, for uh, the Duchess of Cambridge, things like that, that might have got us all feeling, yeah, we want to be British, the nationalists had avoided that by saying, she's still going to be our queen. We were also apparently attached to broadcasting and the nationalists were very careful to make sure that we would still have Downtown Abbey and Doctor Who, because apparently we do care. Uh, we do love our BBC, although some people were quite upset about um, one news uh, article or one news report on the BBC and this caused protests outside the BBC offices in Glasgow. But um, there would have been a Scottish broadcasting service. What does it mean to be British? Um, Gordon Brown in the New York Times gave an article saying that it's all about this idea of a social union, um, our free national health, that we pool our resources and we have a state pension that looks after everyone. When you're having a hard time, you get unemployment benefits. That's, a, that's what being British is all about. Um, these are British values. And as most of the new voters got older, it seems that fears about pensions, this, it seems that that, well, that was a major factor um, in staying with the UK. Another thing that emerged just before the, uh, the, the referendum that could have swung things in a different direction was the fact that Scotland's got oil to the west coast too, but nobody explored for it because of the nuclear submarines. So if we got rid of the submarines, we might have more oil. Looking at the campaign, um, it was a civilised, peaceful debate mainly. Um, David Cameron was very careful that it was a question for the Scottish people, so he did keep away. Um, social media was very important. Uh, I saw lots of things on Facebook and from especially younger people, very, very en engaged. Um, if you expressed your opinion, you got some abusive mail though, so J.K. Rowling was rather famously the subject of abuse online, and the, the tennis player uh, Andy Murray. Rowling said vote no, Andy Murray said vote yes, so they got abuse. And there was a, a campaign, a, an allegation also that the BBC were not being fair, but nobody's ever happy with what the, the BBC reports. Um, there were other international aspects um, that I've already mentioned, the place in the the Security Council, it's not just a thing that the UK loses, it's a thing that the allies of the UK would lose that too. It's been quite handy for the United States to have a, have a country like the UK whenever they're involved in some kind of international operation, to have um, a country like the UK that generally goes along with what you want to do. There were questions for the European Union about letting five million Scottish citizens cease to become citizens of the European Union. I'm in France, living in France, because I'm a citizen of the European Union, okay? I've got a European passport. And would they really let us all go? Um, there were also um, questions about Spain and uh, how would Spain's attitude towards Catalonia affect their attitude to allowing Scotland to join the European Union? And of course, uh, sticking with Catalonia, will the Scottish referendum inspire other nations to split from their states? The people of Catalonia, if you've been following the news, are trying to have a, a referendum in November, and um, this is being blocked um, at the moment. Ah, conclusions. There are a few conclusions, but I'll be quick. I'll try and be quick. High public engagement, that's good. Um, but having to vote for one option or another, that's divisive. Uh, there's never been a better time to be Scottish in the UK, in my opinion. But the next domino towards the breakup of the UK could have fallen last month, and I don't think it's over. The referendum has been praised as a model for dealing with self-determination, in contrast to the position being adopted by the Spanish, who will not allow Catalonia to have a referendum. 
Um, other conclusions, the 45, people are calling themselves the 45, they're part of the 45% who voted yes. Will this high level of public engagement in politics continue? People have habitually been using social media to comment on politics over the last year, year and a half. Will, it, will they just stop now? A first test for me is hydraulic fracturing or fracking as it's called in central Scotland. Licenses were granted within a week or two of the decision uh, in favour of an expert who according to some uh, was a supporter of the no campaign. So um, this is going to be a test. Uh, Scotland votes no and now we're getting fracking. Uh, how will the people react? A lot of people will also be policing the vow. We should have in place um, legislation from January. So everyone's watching that. So people are, are keeping an eye on this, but it could easily be buried and forgotten about and easily become last week's news with other crises. At the moment, we've got Hong Kong and we've got uh, Islamic State beheading people. Some concerns in the conclusions. I'm concerned about the politicians being able to, to keep that vow that they've made. Uh, the circumstances in which the vow was made are a, a real cause of concern. No one had time to consult their parties. Parliament didn't debate it. It's not even clear if the people of Scotland would want the Parliament to have more power, as it was never put to them, nor debated during the two-year campaign. And of course, um, if the people who made the vows are no longer leaders of their parties, well, is there a commitment? That I just see all kinds, it worries me <laughs> where that could go. Another worrying development is English identity. Uh, last weekend, uh, online I saw the first petition um, where people were saying that the English should be given a vote, not about um, them becoming independent, but about whether Scotland should be allowed to stay uh, in the United Kingdom. How impertinent of us to want to leave. Well, actually, we want you to leave now. Now we've got you to stay, we want to kick you out. So I, I found it quite funny that a lot of Scottish yes voters were also signing the petition, with, with saying things like, please kick us out. Um, there's another worry politically that David Cameron has seen members of his um, Conservative Party defecting to U the UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party. They are seeking that the, the United Kingdom leave the e European Union and um, David Cameron is going to have real problems at holding his, uh, his party together because on the one hand they're trying to honour their commitment to Scotland but on the other hand keep people from from joining UKIP is quite hard. And UKIP have also gained support by expressing how unfair things in the UK are for the English. Of course, the two others who signed the vow said that there was no, the vow was not conditional in making things fairer for England, although something has to be done. And I, I really think it would be very difficult for David Cameron to keep his vow and stay in power. Another referendum, uh, why not? We like them, we, we are used to them now. If re-elected, David Cameron has promised there will be a UK referendum in 2017 about leaving the, United, uh, the European Union. Now if this happens, we could have a situation where Scotland could vote to stay in Europe with England voting to leave. And I think we'd see that, and that would give us a new crisis where, uh, again, we see how different the views of the two countries are. And again, I've mentioned the vow, I'll have to stop talking about the vow. Can it be kept? Will it be kept? And like devolution, will it take a second vote before independence is, is settled, as, is become Scotland's settled will? And a last thing on Alex Salmond, um, I don't know if you know the saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. It's based on the Scottish King Robert Bruce. Uh, before, Bannock, before he won the Battle of Bannockburn, he was allegedly in a, in a cage, in a cage, in a cave, sorry, in a cave with watching a spider trying to build a web. And so I think it's quite funny that Alex Salmond has twice resigned as leader of the Scottish National Party. And as I say, 45% is not too far away. Last page. So Scotland, no, but never, but never the same. Yes, we voted no, but the debate has shown Scotland that it could go it alone. And so arguably it's a much more confident country than it's ever been. 
Um, the vow that was made seems to demonstrate that our leaving could have harmed the UK. That, I think that came as news to a lot of people. I, I don't think we really knew that we were that important. It's also shown that there would be no change without pain, I think. Our economy is linked with that of the rest of the UK, and there would be serious concerns about our financial sector's survival. So yeah, we could go it alone. Uh, allegedly, we're the 14th richest country in the world, but uh, some things would, would be put into danger. But now that the marriage has been saved, can we make the relationship better is also a question. And I think one interesting point that was repeatedly said by the Yes campaigners, that London and the southeast of England is substantially richer than elsewhere in the United Kingdom. This, this is another fact that came out, and this is maybe something that could be addressed. And in, in doing so, I, I thought I'd finish with the provocative question, does London need to be the capital of the United Kingdom? We, you've, you'd, you've, you've got your own capital. Other countries have done it, Australia has done it. So if, if having uh, London as the capital of the UK attracts government and attracts people there, you could put the capital somewhere else. It was maybe justified in 1603 when we didn't have trains and planes and modern transport and modern communications. But the government of the UK could be anywhere. And I, my favorite place is, is Liverpool. Um, I'll thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to hear, answer any questions that you've got.